So we'll get started. Thanks so much for everybody who has logged on today. It's really great to see you back here again. This is our third session. Um, and we have a couple of interesting um, different things to talk about today. I'll just get remote control. So um, if you have joined us earlier in the previous two weeks, you'll know who I are, who we are, but for everybody else who's joining us, we are from Caesar Australia. And the program that we're working with at the moment is called Pest Facts Southeastern. And we're here to keep growers and advisors informed about invertebrate, invertebrate pests and beneficials uh, throughout the winter cropping season in Victoria and Southern New South Wales. And this is through the IPM for Grains program, which is funded by the GRDC. And we've got some wonderful research partners, DPIRD, SADI, QDAF and New South Wales DPI. So today, this is our third webinar session, as I said, um, and I would love you all to introduce yourself by the, by the chat there. We'll be using the chat throughout the sessions today. We will possibly have some polls coming through. If not, I'll get you guys to just write your answers in the chat. Um, and we'd love to have the questions come through the chat as well. We will try and keep kind of to our half an hour. We might go a little bit over, but we will be sticking around for questions and discussions afterwards as well. And just letting you know that this session is being recorded. So if you have to leave halfway through, then we will have that recording um, on YouTube for you guys to see um, in the coming weeks. And also I will paste the YouTube um, links to the first two webinars in the chat as well. So today we have three speakers from Caesar Australia. Firstly, Dr. Jess Lai, who's talking about armyworm management. Then Leo is going to be telling us all about the recent um, cockchafer um, outbreaks that we've had in Victoria. And Sam is going to come on to tell us a bit of about aphids and some updated information about um, aphid IDs. So I'll hand over to Jess to start with. Thanks, Lizzie. Well, we'll jump right in. Um, so this week, um, we've had a bit of an army worm theme running throughout all of these webinars. And one reason, um, among others, is uh, last year and also 2019 was a fairly busy year for um, native species of army worm, but also um, we had a incursion of full army worm, which was covered last week. So today I'm going to continue with um, a bit about native species of, of army worm and talk about um, a bit around um, monitoring and the kind of damage that you could expect from them, um, thresholds, and I'll also talk about a de developmental uh, model that we use to judge uh, risk of army worm. So when we talk about army worm, we're talking about quite a few different species, potentially uh, a selection of native species that we'd find in southeastern Australia at this time of year. Um, some more cold tolerant than others, such as um, southern army worm. But we're also talking about um, some other species um, that are exotic, um, such as the beet army worm or fall army worm, which is a recent, um, recent pest in Australia. However, um, when um, thinking about these army worms and um, if you've detected any in your crops, um, in terms of um, determining if you have a native species of army worm, you don't just need to um, think about the morphology, you can also think about the time of year that you found it. So if you're finding army worm in um, autumn through to spring in southeastern Australia, there's a good chance that um, you're either looking at an inland, a southern or common army worm species. And in terms of um, management for them. Um, the developmental timings are pretty similar. Um, one's just a little bit more cold tolerant, but in terms of how you manage, there's, there's no um, notable differences between them. So in terms of armyworm damage um, and risk, uh, it does change a little bit throughout the, the winter cropping season. So at the beginning of the season, um, through autumn and winter, when, when plants are, um, are tillering, um, and have a lot of um, growing leaf tissue, um, you, will, you will find that um, armyworm in the crop will be, will be eating that foliage and causing scalloping damage and, and defoliation. Um, many times um, a crop can outgrow this, um, and this is where thresholds become important. Um, although we have had instances, um, reports in the past where armyworm um, have, um, have been eating um, quite small seedlings um, and, and causing a lot of damage there. So judging um, the phase that the crop is at um, early in the season, but also the, um, 
growth stage of the larvae, whether it's a small larvae or, or a larger, more mature larvae, is going to have an influence on, on how you judge that risk in autumn and winter. But certainly um, in spring, um, as um, after head emergence and particularly as crops start to dry down um, and less green material is available to armyworm, head lopping becomes a risk. Um, so that um, will lead to a change in the action threshold that, that you'll follow later in the season. Um, the, the head lopping risk um, is particularly driven by, um, as I said, a reduction in that grain material um, at, that, at that stage. Um, particularly larger, more mature armyworm um, tend to move up the plants um, and they focus in those nodal areas where there's still a little bit of green material to chew at um, and, and that can lead to the severing of stems. So I mentioned that last year in 2019 were pretty busy years in terms of armyworm. So I've just put a graph down the bottom here, uh, just a little reminder around armyworm reports to PestFact Southeastern and PestFact South Australia since 2006. Um, you can see there are a couple of bumps there, um, but 2019 and 20 have been um, very, very high in terms of reports. So we're just trying to get a little on top of any questions and concerns that would come out from the field um, with, these, uh, with these webinars. So I'm just going to go through a couple of cases that we had um, last year, just to explain um, some of the um, damage that was seen um, from armyworm infestations. So we had um, a report quite early in the year late March from the southwest slopes in southern New South Wales where um, the agronomist was reporting um, quite high damage to an oat crop um, and it was a very young oat crop. It had only been sown a few weeks prior um, and in this situation the armyworm were reported as um, being on the move which is not always um, not always observed. They tend to observe, um, demonstrate this on the move or marching behaviour when um, opportunities for food sources is fairly scarce. But they were on the move and they were uh, moving from one side of the paddock um, from another. Um, and they started to notice damage um, about three weeks off after sowing. They also mentioned that um, the armyworm infestation had not originated in that paddock. Um, it was thought to have originated in an adjacent, adjacent pasture. Um, that becomes... Um, relevant when you think about um, a point that I made in week one, if you were listening in, about armyworm egg laying behaviour. Uh, there has been re research that has shown um, um, quite well that armyworm uh, will preference um, stands of pasture that have a mixture of dried grass and green grass um, in comparison to a stand of pasture that is um, predominantly green. So they really like having access to that dried material. Um, and that also goes for paddocks with high stubble loads, which this pasture was, um, this paddock was reported to have had a high stubble load and it had followed um, two seasons of barley um, in this case. So in this situation, um, they did some monitoring and they found five to six larvae per, per sweep um, for um, a crop that was so young, this is rel a relatively high density. And in this case, the, um, the crop was sprayed out um, due to the damage that they were seeing. And a second case um, in the Riverina area, a little later in the season, so late July in this case, armyworm were reported to be very patchy in um, a paddock of wheat. Um, and it was estimated that half a hectare had been um, basically eaten out where leaf tissue, the tillers were, were gone and only stems were remaining. Um, so in this case, they were very patchy and they were staying in place. They weren't moving across the paddock, um, presumably because there was plenty for them to eat. Um, and in this situation, when the agronomist did some monitoring, he found that they were very easy to find when um, they looked at the base of the plants, they were hiding um, under clods of, clods of soil. Um, so as long as they moved a bit of soil around, they could find them. And in the areas of the paddock where um, they observed the, the outbreak, so in the hotspot areas, the density was quite high. So um, it was estimated at over 50 larvae per square metre in the most damaged areas. Again, a high stubble residue um, in this paddock. Here's just an example photo um, from last year from a paddock with another high stubble load um, from um, central Victoria. And you can see in this instance, fairly mature um, 
large uh, late instar armyworm larvae climbing up the stems and, and they've defoliated the, um, the tillers there and, and there's only stem remaining. But in saying that, um, we had many reports um, last year, around um, 60 reports, and for the most part, there was no significant damage observed. These are just in um, some instances. So I mentioned that um, later in the season, um, as the crop dries down and heads have emerged, um, there is a greater risk, a greater economic risk from armyworm. So as a rule of thumb, we have some thresholds that have basically been based on estimates from, um, from from experts um, that, that we, um, we tend to um, advise. So eight to 10 armyworm larvae per, per meter squared during winter and, and early spring. So before head emergence is, is what we'd suggest across cereals. And then later on um, after head emergence, um, when your head lopping risk becomes greater, that threshold changes and reduces to one to three larvae per meter squared. And this is particularly relevant to barley, which have a thinner stem, um, a slightly more fragile stem than wheat. Um, and in comparison to oat, which has um, multiple panicles. So the, um, the risk of barley um, flowers being lopped off um, quite easily by armyworm is, is a little higher. So if you have a barley crop, that's something to keep in mind. So, um, Given um, what I've said, monitoring for armyworm um, is quite important. Um, and the way that you go about monitoring armyworm is, is also really important. So having a bit of an understanding of the biology will help a lot. Um, armyworm is a noctuid moth. So it tends to become more active in the evening in terms of feeding. So if you're monitoring during the day and you're only looking at the, at the canopy or you're only sweep netting, you might be underestimating how many armyworm you actually have in your paddock. So it's really important to get down on the ground at multiple sites in the paddock um, with a trowel or with your hands and move um, the large clods of soil aside to see if you can find armyworm hiding at the base of plants. Um, sweep netting in combination with um, that visual search is, is, a good, is a good way to go. I'll just end with um, a tool that we can use to further estimate risk. So I mentioned that depending on the growth stage of armyworm, um, smaller armyworms are likely to eat a little less, large armyworms become more voracious and can do more damage to the crop and have large enough mandibles that they can cut through um, the stem and, and, and lop heads. But when you find um, these armyworms, it's important to take note of the size because if you have um, a small or a large armyworm at this time of year, chances are they might pupate before um, you go, get into that um, head lopping risk phase. So at the top, I've, I've just plugged in um, a, a simulation where a large armyworm was found at the 1st of July, July a large mature caterpillar. Um, and in this stage, if a large mature caterpillar was found around the 1st of July, the chances are noted by the green arrow here that pupation would have occurred before head emergence or, or, or the crop drop, drop, dries down and below if a small grub is found then you're starting to approach that risk phase where you might have large grubs still around um, while, while, while you're in that risk um, of, of head lopping um, phase. So this is a model that we use that we often integrate into our pest facts advice. And at the moment, we're trying to develop this into a model that's a bit more user friendly so that pest facts subscribers can use it um, out on farm. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that next week, um, but I'm going to leave it there and hand over to Leo for a cockchafer update. Thanks very much, Jess. <clears throat> Okay, I see I've got remote control. So thanks everyone again for coming along to the third webinar. I'm just going to chat to you today um, quickly about the recent redheaded pasture cockchafer uh, reports we've been receiving and I'll take you through some of the identification features and some management strategies uh, for this pest. But first, um, if I can... yeah. I'm just going to start with this um, graphic here. So we've got four different scarabs on the screen here. And I just want you to note down by yourself there, you don't have to write it in the in the chat or anything, which of these you think is redheaded cockchafer. And then similarly, if you're feeling pretty confident in your identification skills, uh, maybe have a go at trying to um, guess what the other uh, scarabs are. And I'll come back to this 
slide later on in the presentation uh, when I go through redheaded cockchafer identification. And I'll just explain why it's not always the best um, to rely on head color for making a correct identification. So the next slide here is just uh, an image of some of the damage uh, that was reported two weeks ago, um, a report of redheaded cockchafer in Strathbogey in Victoria. And you can see here they've, they've, they've chewed through quite a lot of the, the roots in a ryegrass and clover paddock. And there's about 10, 10 cockchafers there in, in one spade um, that was dug up from this pasture. So they're causing quite significant damage and they were causing bare areas in the paddock. And then these um, bare areas were starting to roll back like a carpet and crows were also starting to come into this paddock. And although they were feeding on the cockchafer, they were actually causing more damage to the paddock because the uh, root structure was so weak and it was loose that they were causing mechanical damage. So just move on that. And this is another report again, more recently, just this week in um, uh, central Victoria as well. And you can see here, the, the paddock was an underutilized paddock that hadn't been grazed um, in the um, much over the last few months. And it's just completely tearing back like a, like a carpet. There's quite a lot of grubs in underneath. And you can see here where the um, paddock was actually set to be re-sown. And when the uh, sower was going across the, the paddock, the tines were just pulling off all of the pasture and it was just completely lifting off real easily. So there has been reports, as I mentioned, there's been three uh, reports in the past two weeks and they've been predominantly found in ryegrass and clover paddocks, quite characteristically causing the pasture to roll back um, like a carpet and, and, and as I said, it, in some instances, livestock have been causing a bit of damage because the root structure is so weak and crows are also causing some damage to the paddock as well. And there's, there's bare patches um, across the paddock, which is reducing the, the feed available for livestock. So redheaded um, pasture cockchafer, as you mostly would know, is um, a beetle, a species of beetle. Um, and it's found in... Uh, the southern uh, region um, of southeastern Australia. And they're identified by their grayish white to cream color. Um, they have a, a hard red brown head capsule, which gives them their name. And as you can see, uh, hopefully you can see it clearly in this image here, the a characteristic feature of um, redheaded pasture cockchafer is this pitted um, pitting on the head capsule. It's, it's, it's little indentations on their head capsule. They grow up to 30 centimeters um, in length when they're fully grown, the larvae, and they characteristically curl into a C shape, usually when they're just lying um, in the soil. They feed underneath the soil as well. So they, they feed exclusively in the, in the soil. They don't actually come up onto the uh, soil surface and feed on foliage. They feed on the roots of um, pastures. And again, they have three thoracic legs uh, and they have no other legs on their body. A characteristic as well of the redheaded pasture cock, oh, sorry, 30 uh, millimeters, 30 millimeters. Uh, thanks for uh, that, Joe. Um, yeah, 30 millimeters in length when fully grown, not 30 centimeters, as I've mentioned here, that would be quite large. <laughs> um, another feature. Uh, of the red-headed cockchafer is the horizontal slit at the rear of their body. Um, so it's a, it's a straight horizontal uh, slit opening and they also have a fringe of hairs along one side of the slit that taper off into um, some stubble. So the red-headed pasture cockchafer are um, part of a, a family of beetles known as scarabs. And they're present in southeastern Australia, but they're not the only scarabs um, pests present. Uh, there's also black-headed, yellow-headed cockchafer, African black beetle, and Argentinian scarab that are uh, considered pests. However, as I mentioned earlier on, it, it's not always the best to rely on head color alone to identify um, scarab beetles, uh, scarab larvae, because head color can quite often be ambiguous. What and even um, among the same species, it can quite often vary slightly. Um, also, 
not all scarabs um, are named for their head color, as you can clearly see in this image here, the African black beetle and um, Argentinian scarab are not named for their head color. And also there is sometimes is a misidentification of non-pest scarab species. So for example, last year um, we had a scarab sent to us, which was thought to be yellow headed cockchafer and Julius Severi here um, put it under the microscope and actually was able to identify it as a small um, dung beetle, um, which is not a pest uh, at all. It usually feeds on dung and organic uh, decaying matter in the soil. And um, it's part of the Aphodinae family. So it's not part of the same family as the yellow-headed cockchafer. Um, and most of the scarabs in that family are actually non-pest species. The only one in Australia that is considered a pest is actually the black-headed cockchafer. So hopefully that has uh, maybe given you a bit of insight into why head color is not always the uh, best to rely on for identification. So I've brought back up this slide again, and maybe now you might want to reassess what you had chosen before. I suppose it's a little bit um, cheeky of me to expect if you were able to guess every one of these correctly, because as you can see, they all look very, very similar. And I haven't really shown any of the distinguishing characteristics other than the head color, which is probably the point I was trying to make. So the first one was red-headed cockchafers. Then we have yellow-headed is number two, African black beetle. And just uh, the Argentinian scarab um, is number four. And I just found this in my local park on the weekend. Um, so it goes to show you that they're out and about. So I'll just take you through the life cycle of the red-headed cockchafer now. Um, this is a two-year life cycle. I've actually, uh, I've, I've just split it up one year here and one year below because I couldn't fit it all in the um, screen. So I'm just going to turn on, um, where can I do this? Yes. So the larvae emerge in the spring here and they feed across the spring and summer months. And they tend to, their feeding tends to slow down uh, across the winter. They don't feed as much as they do in the warmer months. And then in August feeding tends to become more active again in the larvae. And then they pupate uh, across the summer months. So they pupate across the summer and uh, adults begin emerging from the um, pupa in the uh, February, March, April time. However, the adults actually remain in the soil inactive until August. They don't emerge from the soil until August where they um, start to come up and lay their eggs in the, so uh, in the soil then. And adults of the red-headed um, pasture cockchafer prefer quite a dense sward to lay their eggs in, and they lay their eggs singly in the soil. So a control tactic for this is actually to, to graze the paddock a bit tighter in the springtime. And uh, this can help minimize ideal oviposition sites for the adult uh, when they do come to lay eggs. So as I mentioned, they, they oh, well, I actually didn't, but they affect a range of annual and perennial grasses and clover. Um, clovers, and this is because their non-tussock grasses are most vulnerable to the uh, area that the red-headed pasture cockchafer feeds in. It's the top 15 centimeters of the soil, which is predominantly where the roots of these grasses are. And um, so grasses with uh, deeper roots are actually less susceptible. And they are usually only problematic in areas of around 500 to 800 millimeters of rain. And just this morning, I went back through uh, some of our uh, historical reports on pest facts of this species and over the past 10 years we've had about a dozen or so reports of red-headed cockchafer and I compared that with the um, annual rainfall during these years and during the years that they were most um, problematic uh, it, it lined up with, with, with this, this amount of rainfall. It was usually in years with average to above average rainfall where they were more prominent. And they also are, um, prefer sandy loams. Uh, that's also not to say that they, they can't be found in wetter areas because they have been reported in wetter years and wetter areas. So feeding damage can often um, go unnoticed, uh, un 
less outbreaks become very large. And that's because the nature of the way they feed on the roots, um, you don't start to notice any of the damage until the roots have been damaged quite a lot. And, and you might notice the pasture being, being rolling back, or you might notice bare patches in your paddock. As I said here, this is that, that rolling back, characteristic rolling um, from the report earlier this week. So the management side is, is a little bit trickier. Um, there's no insecticides registered for red-headed pasture cockchafer, unfortunately. And that's because where they feed in the soil, insecticides just, just don't reach them. So the, the, the main practices are actually cultural uh, management practices. So it's, you should try to avoid putting livestock on uh, affected paddocks uh, to protect the root structure and give it, give it a chance to uh, rejuvenate itself. In more severe infestations, um, it's probably best to leave the, the paddock fallow completely um, and, and really give it a chance to, to rejuvenate its roots. And if uh, situations are quite bad and the, the pasture has been really decimated, you could consider sowing a tap-rooted forage brassica crop. Now, this is if the time of year permits and if your feed supply also permits. Um, this is because the, the forage brassica has a much deeper root so um, the red-headed cockchafer don't tend to, to feed on it as much as they would uh, the shallow rooted grass species. Uh, you can also rotate uh, your grass pasture with grass species that are less susceptible. As I mentioned earlier, ones with slightly longer root systems, such as flaris, uh, tall fescue, coxfoot, and even lucerne. And as I mentioned earlier too, a management uh, technique to help minimize overposition sites for uh, adult beetles is to graze um, the paddock close in the springtime. And also if rejuvenating paddocks, um, it can be helpful to actually till the soil and, and roll it to help expose any larvae uh, to birds for some biological control. So thank you very much. I'm gonna pass you over to Sam Ward now and she'll take you through some aphid identification. Thanks Leo. Um, and thanks everyone for having me here today. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about grain aphid identification and I'm going to start by asking why is correct aphid identification important? Well, for many reasons, uh, to prevent control failures due to insecticide resistance. Now, this could be if you have green peach aphid in a paddock, for example, green peach aphid has evolved resistance to several chemical mode of action groups. This includes pyrethroids, carbamates, organophosphates, neonicotinoids. So if it was incorrectly identified, and you thought you were able to spray out another aphid, this failure would, this, this control would fail. But also it can prevent insecticide resistance from developing by correctly identifying aphids in your paddock. Also, different aphids cause different damage in crops. Certain aphid species are very good vectors of viruses. So green peach aphid, for example, is the primary vector in transmitting turnips yellow virus, whereas cabbage aphid, turnip aphid, either don't transmit the virus or much lesser so. Damage can also depend on the crop stage. Green peach aphid in canola can cause issues at crop establishment, yet cabbage and turnip aphids cause issues during the flowering crop. But where do we begin? Now we don't recommend identifying aphids that are alates, that are winged, or that have wing buds. This is just because it's more difficult to identify and see those morphological traits. It's the same with nymphs, particularly the earlier nymphal stages. It's very difficult. A lot of the traits are very similar across different species. And so we suggest wingless adults. These are the best for identification. But what next? So you've got your aphid, but also it helps to identify the host plant that they're on. This narrows down the number of species that you may have. Also the color of the aphid, the size and appearance of the aphid, whether they're furry, waxy, glossy, for example, and also using different distinguishing markings. So do they have black bars, blotches, for example, on their body? But I'm gonna start by telling you about canola aphids. So there are three main canola aphids. These include the green peach aphid that you've got on the left here, the turnip aphid and the cabbage aphid. Now on the next slide, I've got some bigger pictures. These are all wonderful sketches from Alir at Caesar 
And you'll see just by a quick glance, they look very different. Now, obviously when you're in a paddock, they're not as big as this and it's not as clear. So it's harder to tell. But just at first glance, you can say you've got different body shapes, different colors. You know, you've got this white on, on the, uh, the cabbage aphid. So just to start, your green peach aphid, it's very egg shaped. It's more elongate than your turnip and your cabbage aphid. It's also got much longer antennae. So the antennae reach all the way down to the end of the body, whereas you'll see with the other species here, it stops about halfway down or above. The colors, as I say, the green peach aphid here is pale yellow, green or green. However, a note of warning, color is not always useful for identification. There is a lot of color variation in many aphids, but green peach aphid is a prime example. These top three pictures you've got here are all green peach aphid. So you've got pinky reds, you've got sort of yellowies to greens, and you've also got almost a black there. But also there are variation in appearances within species as well. So the cabbage aphid, when it recently sheds from nymphal stage, it doesn't have any white powder. So the white powder that's usually clearly distinguishable as an adult, if it's just shed, this isn't obvious. And also the lack of bars as well. You'll see these are both cabbage aphid here and you've got your bars here on the, bo the body, but not here. So you've got to take it with a bit of a pinch of salt and pull all these morphological traits together when you're identifying the species. But two traits that are, are really good to use for canola aphids are the siphuncles. Now these are, the, these are all the, the rears of the different aphids that you can see here, green peach aphid, turnip and cabbage. And the siphuncles, which are basically exhaust pipes coming out of the rear of the aphid, their length relative to the cowder, which is the tail, this little pointy bit at the end of the, the body, the length relative to the tail is what can identify these different canola aphids. So the green peach aphid you'll see, their exhaust pipes, their siphuncles reach further than the tail. Yet in turnip aphid, it reaches to the base of the cowder, the tail. But with the cabbage aphid, it doesn't even reach the bottom of the body. So these are clearly distinguishable. You don't need a microscope for this. You can actually use a hand lens and you can do it in the field. But not just that, if you look at the front end of the aphid, the, the small bumps you've got on the in, inner of the antennae, these are called the tubercles, these vary. Now it's a bit more difficult with the turnip and the cabbage. They look much of a muchness. You can see there, they're just one hump. But with the green peach aphid, it bends inwards on itself. So it curves in and this makes it much more distinguishable from the other aphids in canola. But I'm gonna move swiftly on to cereal aphids. Now I could spend all day talking about different cereal aphids. So I'm gonna focus on three today. And that's the Russian wheat aphid, obviously newly arrived, first discovered here in 2016. The oat aphid and the corn aphid. And again, if you look at these, you can see quite distinguishable differences when they're blown up on a screen, either through body shape or color. But I'm gonna run through each one quickly now. So the oat aphid, now usually this is a bit of a, a darker marbly color here. Now, if you've got a microscope, it's great when you can count the antennal segments, but realistically, this, this isn't gonna happen in the field. So you've really got to look at the pear shape of their body. They're really sort of quite dumpy things. They've got these blunt tips on their siphuncles, those exhaust pipes I was talking about before. Now that can be a little bit trickier to see, but the one thing you can really notice is the rust ready patch at the base of the abdomen here in between the different siphuncles. So you'll see in this picture, I mean, it's not in color, so it would be red. Uh, it, it's a bit of a bigger patch, but over here, it's more of a line, but you have red in whichever way it might be. Now with the corn aphid, it's a lot more elongate. It's more oblong shaped, both here. You can probably notice it more from the photograph there than the, uh, the diagram, than with the oat aphid. And again, going back to those siphuncles, they're a great way to identify aphids. There are two dark patches at the base of each of these siphuncles. And again, you can see it clearing the color here in the photograph. And the Russian wheat aphid, I always think of this aphid as being a bit of a textbook example. It's green, it's long, it's, it's what you expect to see. But if you look closely, there is a dusting of white wax that you can see on Russian wheat aphids. Again, this varies a little bit as with the cabbage aphid, it can be a bit harder to see, but they have very short antennae. They've got these two cowl processes, these two little tails sticking out the end of them. 
and really noticeable, they have these absolutely tiny exhaust pipes, those siphuncles, which are barely noticeable by the eye. Now, I, that's a very quick overview. I appreciate we haven't got a lot of time today, but if you want to understand more, particularly about the Russian wheat aphid, we've got our pest bites on YouTube. I think Lizzie's popped that uh, in the link. Yeah, the link in the chat. Thank you for that, Lizzie. Um, and you can have a look and it's, I think it's a couple of minutes of video there that goes into a bit more detail where I've actually stolen a lot of these photographs from. Um, but we did actually have a question earlier today and it, they were, we were asked, uh, what does it mean for aphids in terms of the temperatures remaining mild, um, you know, coming from the winter into, sorry, from the summer into the winter months? Long story short, it's, it's a very hard question to answer. Um, it very much depends on the aphid species. They have very different temperature thresholds. A Russian wheat aphid, for example, can withstand much lower, milder temperatures, you know, 12 degrees or so. Um, but it could enhance the green bridge, so it could go either way. It also depends on summer conditions. Now, if you have, you know, quite a, a harsh summer, that can also lead to die-off in aphids. But what we can say from our experience so far this year is we've had very few reports on aphids. If we do suddenly have a lot of reports coming in, obviously we'll keep you informed through pest facts online. Um, and, and yeah, and I mean, with Russian wheat aphid, um, I've got up here, this has been mentioned in previous webinars, so you may have seen it before, uh, but we have delved a bit deeper with Russian wheat aphid and, um, you know, with certain species, it's, you are able to track them through years of data to, to try and work out, you know, are they going to go mad in this, this particular season or not? Uh, but this is a fantastic tool. Uh, it's housed on the GRDC Russian wheat aphid webpage. Uh, also, it can be found on the resources page on, on our website. Uh, so either way, it will take you there. But it's basically a calculator to determine the economic injury level and action threshold for Russian wheat aphid. So you can input some of these, um, this cost of control, for example, year potential, and you can get an, an outcome there. So I urge you to go and have a look at it. Even if you haven't got aphids, it's good fun to play with. But thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Sam. And um, for everybody online, do keep an eye out for the next webinar, which we'll be having coming up soon, which is going to talk about all the different management tools that we have available at the moment. So thanks so much to Jess and Leo as well for those sessions there. Um, for the purposes of the people online, I am going to stop the recording now. Thanks very much for joining us and keep an eye out for future webinars.